everyone. It's great to see you again after our break for the, for the Memorial Day holiday. Welcome to the Flint Community Webinar, your community resource every Friday at noon. We've got a really, really great lineup for you today, including our wonderful Nurse T and Dr. Latressa Gordon. We've also got Becky Gaskin here, Executive Director of our local chapter in Flint of the American Red Cross. DeAndrea Smith, who's our sickle cell account manager, who's going to talk to us a little bit about sickle cell, and Dr. Brittany Taylor, who's going to talk to us a little bit about cannabis use and health effects. We're going to get started. I see Becky and DeAndra. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your expertise with us today. We're oh, so well, thank you for having us. We're so glad to be here. Uh, again, I'm Becky Gaskin, um, and I'm happily serving as the executive director for the East Central Bay chapter in Michigan. East Central Bay means that I cover Genesee County up through Aranac and through the Thumb area. So um, happy to be here again. The American Red Cross, our mission is to alleviate and prevent human suffering in the face of emergencies by empowering and mobilizing our volunteers um, and through the dedication of our donors. Um, and so I'm happy to be here. We have five lines of service. When I was here last time, we talked about kind of the overarching March is Red Cross month. I was able to be here and talk about what we do in each line of service, just that general line. Um, and so one of the things we talked about was our home fire campaign and our sound the alarm. So I'm just gonna quick give an update because we kind of encouraged some volunteers and we can do a drum drum roll because we are so excited about drum roll. We did, um, we're very, very pleased. We were able to install, so our smoke, for those of you who are just joining us, and we're, we're not here for uh, March's Red Cross Month when I spoke last time, our sound the alarm is where we try to install free smoke detectors. We do it all year long as part of our home fire campaign, but it's that one time of the year that we really um, focus in and try to get as many smoke alarms in the hands and in the homes of people who need them to keep homes safe and to um, you know, prevent fatalities and, and, and loss um, of property or life. So we were able to install in East Central Bay in our 10 counties, um, 600 and uh, one smoke alarms, free smoke alarms. We were able to educate 600 individuals and we were able to make 244 homes more safe. Wow. So for the state, we were first in the country to, to with our um, smoke alarms installs. We were able to install 1,962 smoke detectors across the state of Michigan. So we were so excited. We were number one in the country. So just on that note, we have a lot to celebrate, but we have also a lot to celebrate when we talked, we talked about, you do think of the Red Cross, you think of blood donations and blood services, which is a huge part of what we do, but going diving in deeper about the needs of people with um, rare blood disorders and their need for um, blood donations, we have our sickle cell initiative. And we have an expert in the house and within our region, um, our sickle cell um, program manager, Deandra Smith, um, is just remarkable. And I'm so glad to turn it over to her because she's truly the expert. We've worked together on a few um, really focused sickle cell blood drives. And we're hoping to educate and advocate for more of that across um, our local area. We want to really boost those numbers up. And Deandra, I'm going to yeah, let you take I over. My webinar and today. Thank you. Yes, my name is Deandra Smith and I am the sickle cell account manager with the American Red Cross. I cover the entire state of Michigan, so I travel throughout the state educating communities about sickle cell, as well as setting up blood drives for diverse blood donors and for sickle cell patients. And so I do have a presentation that I would love to share with you all mm -hmm. to just dive deeper into the topic of why we need these uh, diverse blood drives and what exactly is sickle cell? So I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to go off video so I don't look cross-eyed when I'm reading. <laughs> no and I'm going to uh, just present to you my presentation. Can everyone see my video? We can, we can see your slides. Okay, yep. thank you. So at the American Red Cross, all blood types are needed. 
you know, uh, every blood donation is important to maintaining a diverse blood supply. And that's really the number one priority for donor services with the American Red Cross. Diverse blood donors may have the unique ability to help patients suffering with different illnesses and inherited diseases. Did you know that every two seconds, someone in someone needs blood? And so when you think about it, just counting the two, you know, someone is in need of blood. And we need a diverse blood supply for the health and safety of just all communities, for diverse communities, because not all blood is the same. There's more to a blood type than just A, B, or O. When you're talking about just different inherited diseases or illnesses, it goes beyond the type of blood and, it's, and it goes to the antigens that are on the blood. And those antigens uh, vary by race and ethnicity. Generally, the blood blood match for patients requiring frequent transfusions is from donors of the same ethnic or genetic background. And so when we look at the, the value, the propensity values and uh, varies with different populations. And so my job here at the Red Cross is to get everyone, uh, these diverse populations donating and getting their donation numbers up. Uh, certain blood characteristics are inherited. And so you're more likely to find them within a certain donor group. And as you see by these numbers, we, we're looking to just raise um, not only awareness about diverse populations donating, but actually the number of donors that are donating to the Red Cross. And so, you know, it, it's going to take all of us because we have our work cut out for us to just spread the awareness and the knowledge of getting everyone to donate because you don't know when you're going to be in need of blood or someone you love uh, might need a blood transfusion. So what is sickle cell? Sickle cell disease is an inherited blood disorder that distorts the shape of the blood. Instead of the blood cells uh, being round and soft and living for about 120 days, they are actually hard and shaped like crescents and they only live for about 15 days. Um, with your red blood cells, your red blood cells carry oxygen to uh, major organs and other parts of the body. And with these blood cells that are crescent shaped, not only are they dying off faster, but they are actually blocking the blood flow to the rest of the body. As a result, you know, the blood has difficulty, difficulty flowing smoothly and carrying oxygen to the rest of the body. Sickle cell is the most common disorder in the US. One in every 365 African Americans have sickle cell disease and one in 13 African Americans have the traits. And here's where donors come in. One in three African-American donors are a match for patients with sickle cell disease. And so we just encourage those to roll up their sleeves and donate because you can be helping to improve the quality of life for sickle cell patients. Complications of sickle cell disease, um, it varies. It has many different complications from um, anemia to blood clots to organ damage to vision loss, stroke, but a big, a big, big, big problem with sickle cell is pain. And this is pain is invisible. You can't look at someone and see that they're in pain. Um, this is the type of pain that you cannot get or get it to go away with uh, over a counter prescription or drug, you know, you can't take two Tylenol and rest, 
the pain that sickle cell patients experience when the blood is clotted because of the abnormal uh, shape of the cells, they may be in the hospital for two to three weeks at a time. You know, this is excruciating pain from head to toe. You know, you never know because because of the blood flowing throughout the body, the, the blood can also get blocked anywhere and the pain can occur anywhere. So you have just a lot of different complications with the disease. And many patients with sickle cell require frequent blood transfusions. Some patients will receive up to 100 blood transfusions in a year. Some patients go in and get blood transfusions every two weeks. Some patients, you know, may not need them quite as often, but we want all patients with sickle cell to rest assured that when they go in, whether it's for an emergency or for their regular visit, that that blood is gonna be available on the shelves. So who does sickle cell affect? Sickle cell affect millions of people around the world. It is most common in Africa, the Middle East and India. Uh, the World Health Organization and the United Nations recognize sickle cell as a global health issue. It is estimated that over 100,000 people in the US have sickle cell disease. Here are some familiar sickle cell warriors that you may know. Um, Paul Williams with the Temptations. We have from the rap group Mob Deep Prodigy. Uh, Santino Holmes, NFL player, has the trait. Tiki Barber has the full disease. T Boz um, from the singing group TLC, she has the disease as well. And it's so many other famous people with the disease, but now you know someone locally in your area, and that's me. I have sickle cell disease myself. Um, I was diagnosed at the age of two years old because back then they weren't automatically checking for sickle cell disease in every live birth. So my parents didn't find out until I was two. Um, and I have really went through a lot with my disease. I have been hospitalized numerous times. Um, I have suffered vision loss, organ damage, um, just multiple surgeries due to complications because of my disease. And I say um, we, we have Sickle Cell Awareness Month, June 19th is World Sickle Cell Day. But sickle cell disease is a 365 day a year disease. And we need your help to not only raise awareness, but to host and schedule blood drives for sickle cell patients like myself. So how can you help? You can help by building the awareness of the needs and benefits with your employees, members of the community, and you can get engaged to donate blood. You can also host the blood drive. Um, I work with churches, community centers, businesses, or you can actually schedule a virtual uh, blood drive. And when you donate blood, make sure you mark your race on your donor record because you are taking the extra st step to make sure that individuals with sickle cell disease or rare blood types are helped. We are making sure that different communities, diverse communities have the blood available that they need. When you check your race, you help the Red Cross better ensure the search for rare blood types that best meet the needs of patients of all backgrounds. And that is the end of my presentation. Any questions? We do actually have some questions that came up in the chat. Someone asked if you could think about explaining the difference between sickle cell disease and the trait. And how does that look? You mentioned some people who have sickle cell trait and have sickle cell disease. And what does that mean? Yes, yes, that is an excellent question. So sickle cell trait, like I said, one in every 13 African-Americans have the trait. Uh, the trait just means that you are a carrier and you can possibly have children that have the disease. 
um, there's a one in 25 percent chance that if you and your partner both have uh, have the trait that with every birth there's a 25 percent chance that the child would have the disease so typically um, this is not a hundred percent but typically those with the trait does not do not have any type of medical issues like those with uh, the full disease. Now, there are always exceptions to that. Um, people with the trait have their, you know, have had complications, but majority uh, do not. They are just a carrier. Um, also, it was, it's known that people with, trick, with sickle cell trait actually, um, have a barrier against malaria. And so uh, those with the trait, um, it, it even though it's a genetic disease, it actually helped um, in other parts of the world. I'm talking and I realize I'm muted, so I didn't have any <laughs> background noise interrupting your great your great explanation. Right. We've seen that, right? That someone who's a carrier has some protection against malaria, particularly in our parts of the world that are more likely to experience malaria. I appreciate you mentioning that. It was also really interesting that you described the idea that two people who are carriers have a 25% chance with every pregnancy of having someone who might have sickle cell, having a child who might have sickle cell. And there's also a 50% chance, right, that they will have a child who is a carrier, right? Because genetically sort of that's how that works. Um, thank you for, for giving us some more information about that. You described some of your own experiences, right? You, ex you showed us pictures, you were willing to share your experience. Can you tell us a little bit more about what it's been like for you living with sickle cell on a daily basis it's a roller coaster yeah <laughs> you right. know some days I wake up and I feel great like I take on the world and five minutes later into me having a great day I may it may start with just a little bit of discomfort and it goes into full-blown pain there have been times where I live in a very small condo um there have been times where I couldn't even walk to uh the restroom or stand in the shower on my own because the pain was so severe. Um, complications. I'm partially blind in my right eye because of sickling behind my eye, um, yeah. pulled apart my retina and it detached my retina. I've had two reconstructive knee surgeries because of bone loss and bone density problems. I've had my gallbladder taken out. Um, I've had acute chest syndrome, pneumonia just different things is I never, what I hate worse about my disease is it being so unpredictable. I never know when it's going to flare. I could have little signs where, okay, I'm, I'm tiring easily. I'm, I'm a little achy and you know, it, it may not turn into a full blown sickle cell crisis. And then, or it may, there have been times where I was only experienced pain or discomfort for a couple of hours. And there has been times where the longest I've been in the hospital is for two weeks um, with consistent and constant pain because uh, my blood was not flowing properly. And I was just experiencing pain from head to toe. Um, they, there have been different research done on you know how to describe the pain or what do they compare the pain to there was one uh research done i forgot uh the name of the researchers but they compared the pain to childbirth you know um some other people describe it as you know the worst pain in their life or breaking a bone it is just it, it varies but for me i just try to take life by by the horn every day i'm thankful when i can wake up pain free i i get going i i try to just really take full advantage of the time that i have that i am not you know tired or in pain or experiencing a complication so if you see me bouncing off the walls that's why because i'm i fully take advantage of of my health and of the time that I have uh, during my day. 
I really appreciate how positive your outlook is when you describe that, right? As you describe, you know, what is not knowing what your day is going to be, that you could wake up and it could be, you know, ex extraordinary pain or it could be fatigue. You just don't know. And the amount of positivity that you have is just exemplary. I want to talk about something that you've mentioned a few times and a little bit I want to talk about it with my physician hat of like holding us responsible because you talk about the pain that people experience in sickle cell and you described it so perfectly, right? It's not something that we can necessarily see, right? And particularly for people who have lived with sickle cell, there is a there can sometimes be a level of um, coping, right? Just uh, tolerating a certain level of pain and maybe it's not all over your face, right? Maybe it's not super clear of the, the extent to which you're in pain. And one of the things that I think you said that I feel like is really important is, is understanding how severe the pain can be when people are admitted. Oftentimes we're admitting them in the hospital for fluids to help, right? pain relief, and we're thinking about some of the complications that you described. Um, and I want to, I want to uh, hold space for people to be seen and be, you know, be listened to, be heard, right? And to understand that people have pain and for us to hear that. Um, understanding that particularly in Black and Brown communities already, there is sort of a reticence to, to believe pain, right? We've seen multiple studies that have described that when, when Black people or patients are in pain, they are treated uh, with less doses of pain medicine and, and treated less frequently. Um, so I, I just think that's something that we have to highlight and honor about what you said. Yes, I, and you know, I, I have started I've been advocating for sickle cell for the past 20 years. I've been an advocate. I volunteered on my own. You know, I always did support for sickle cell awareness. And it started off with me being in college and getting sick and them turning me away. And so pain is, is invisible. And I think a lot of sickle cell patients, we know how to manage and hide our pain so well that, you know, when we do come into, I, I go into the doctor and I look normal. I may go, I may go straight after work. I, I you know, if I'm suffering, I, I live, you know, if I'm, I, if I'm working two hours away from my home for the day, because like I said, I cover the state of Michigan, I'm going to wait till I get back home. And sure. so I may be in work clothes. I may be in no matter what I'm in, you know, you may not always know that I'm in pain, but I am. And there has been times where I experienced being turned away while I'm still in pain at the hospital or being released with a pain level of eight, but I'm still being released to go home. Mm -hmm. So that is very, uh, thank you for, for, pardon me, for just saying that and, and, knowing that because it does get hard sometimes when you know you this is the work that you do that you commit to um that I ask about and sometimes I I have to advocate for myself still and explain to them no I, you shouldn't be releasing me in this much pain mm -hmm. I appreciate, I appreciate you being willing to be vulnerable about your own experience. There are a couple questions in the chat that I want to follow up on. One, you described a, com a, a complication that I know well and I've treated and I, I knew exactly what you were talking about, but I wondered if you'd talk a little bit about acute chest syndrome and what that means from what your experience was. And then we've got a follow-up a question about um, how people can donate blood, where and how they, that if, could you send the link to people so that they could know where to donate blood? Yes, yes. There are many, um, you can go to redcrossblood.org and you can actually put in your, you can put in your zip code and it will, it will follow up. I can also send out uh, links to different sickle cell blood drives throughout the state for this month. And yes, with acute chest syndrome, it's it's so hard to des describe for me because I had it a couple times and each time it was different. You know, one time I 
I, I felt like I knew that something was wrong because my chest was hurting so much. And it's it's when you have sickling in the lungs because of the, the odd shape of the half moon cells when they're traveling up. Like I said, they can get stuck anywhere and you have sickling within your lungs and it make it harder for you to breathe. But you can also experience pain with that pain in your chest and a cough. Um, and so sometimes it mirrors pneumonia if if people don't see it right or just a respiratory uh, symptom if they're not checking or if they don't know that you have sickle cell and they're not checking for that. Um, one time I just thought that I myself just had, you know, just a respiratory infection because it was going around and I end up having acute chest syndrome. So mm -hmm. I encourage all people that do have sickle cell that anytime they experience pain, anytime they, you know, just go get checked out. You know, I know we're tired of going to the hospital and we stay in the hospital, but pain is also an almost uh, a secondary implication of something else that's going on in the body. It could be infection, it could be dehydration, it could be a number of other things. So it's just always best to get checked out. But again, you can go to redcrossblood.org to look at um, blood drives throughout uh, the organization. And uh, we do have specific blood drives in your area that we can also send out and uh, share the link. Deandra, thank you so much for giving us that context. It's funny because, you know, I people understand the lungs or, or certain areas of the body and don't, aren't necessarily thinking about the fact that all of those places, all those parts of the body have a blood supply. So, right, when you talk about, right, your lungs and how sickle cell affects your lungs, it's not immediately clear that sickle cell would affect the lungs, right? But it mm -hmm. affects the blood supply to the lungs. So though that sickling that happens, right? Those half moon shapes that you were talking about are occluding, blocking vessels that supply the lungs. And it looks a lot like, like what we call pulmonary embolisms almost, right? It looks a lot like areas of the lung that aren't able to get oxygen and that causes pain and that can be a really severe, as you've described, a really severe negative outcome. It's something we try to teach our resident physicians who are in training, our new docs, our med students, like this is a severe, you know, significant potential um, outcome that can happen in people who have sickle cell. You know, if you have fever, if you have many respiratory symptoms with sickle cell, you need to be getting in because this, I mean, and it's an, it's a severe outcome that has a high mortality associated with it, yes. right? So it's something we really need to be thinking about. Um, we had one more question about clarifying sickle trait and sickle cell. And I know you, you described it very well as, as sickle trait being sort of people who are carriers. We have heard there's some data out there that sometimes people with sickle trait might have mild symptoms, right? Yes. But usually not as significant as those with people who have sickle cell. And sickle cell, people with sickle cell usually have, you know, you know have full-blown disease where they're experiencing these crises that you've described. Um, I really, really appreciate your description. Do you have any last comments or thoughts that you really want to make sure people are left with before we let you go? I just, I just encourage you to donate blood. I encourage you to, um, not only for sickle cell patients like myself, but here at the Red Cross, we, we supply blood for all those that need it. Whether it's a genetic disorder like sickle cell, a mother uh, having a complicated birth, car accidents, trauma, um, just different things. I, I say blood donation and having blood is like having insurance. You, you never know when you're going to need it, but when you need it, you're going to be glad that you have it. So when you walk into the hospital and you walk into, you know, uh, your doctor's appointment and you want to know that the blood is on the shelves. Um, a lot of time with sickle cell patients, like I said, some of us have to have frequent every two week blood transfusions. And because depending on where they are, what city they are, uh, how close the hospital is, the type of you know appointment, 
there have been times where they went in and blood was not available because maybe that blood went to um, a trauma patient or that it was just not enough to go around and they had to wait. So think about already having an illness that affects you and the anxiety that it brings that you don't know the outcome and then you go in for your regularly scheduled blood transfusion and make you feel better to make you feel normal. And they said, they say, I'm sorry, but something else, you know, a, another patient needed mm -hmm. it and we don't have enough for you. And so that's what donating does. It makes sure that we have enough blood to go around for everyone that needs it. And so I would just implore you to look at uh, redcrossblood.org, type in your zip code for an upcoming blood drive in your area. And if you have space at your office, your church, um, your organization to get in contact with us so that we can partner together and host a blood drive uh, with your organization to just not only raise awareness, but uh, get more donors. And I thank yeah, you all for your time. Question. Yes. We have one more question in the chat and it's such a good one that I, I'm going to risk your, your time a little bit. I'm so sorry. Okay. The question is, who do we turn to for emotional support and are there local groups? And it felt important because we've talked a lot about the stigma and the severity of disease and how hard it can be. And who should people turn to who are suffering with, with sickle cell, might need some support? Are there local groups? Are there people we should be thinking about reaching out to? Yes. So um, I, I definitely, I've been working with the Sickle Cell Disease Association of Michigan for the past 20 years, even before I start working. And I still volunteer with them. Um, they have uh, different chapters throughout the state of Michigan. So you can, all, you can always look at the Sickle Cell Disease Association of America. And they actually have a, a patient support group that I'm a part of. And they also have a caregiver support group. So say if you have the trait, but your children have the disease or you, you're taking care of someone with the disease, they have a support group. Um, I also recommend, um, it takes a village, but sometimes, you know, you never know. Your village may be going through their own trials and tribulations. So you gotta make sure that you have other areas. I, I rely on my support group. I rely on the Red Cross. Um, doing these type of, presentations just give me so much pride and joy that I'm doing something that positively affect the outcome of my disease. But then I also, I also speak with the therapist because it is also very hard doing this work and running into so many people that, that tell me on almost a weekly or daily basis, I know someone who had sickle cell or my cousin or my mom or my aunt or my grandfather or my uncle passed away from sickle cell. And so, you know, I, I feel like that that responsibility that because I'm living with sickle cell is to just continue to just spread awareness about what this disease is and just keep on fighting for those um, that no longer have a voice and making sure that those that are here are comfortable and their quality of life is better um, because of the sickle cell patients. I want everyone to spend like 30 seconds just celebrating you because you're sh you sharing your vulnerability of your own experience, you educating our community, you sharing your experience, like being thoughtful about your own mental health and what this have, might mean for your mental health and being proactive and thinking about that really give space to other people to allow them to do the same, to think about what they need, what resources they need, and realize that they're not alone in this experience. So I just want to celebrate you and I really thank you for your time. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. I'm going to go off camera and cry. I'm going to it together. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank we you We appreciate so much. your time. Thank you so much. All right, we're going to pivot a little bit. Thank you, too, Becky. We appreciate Oh, no, this over. is why Deandra needed to be here. She's <laughs> truly a warrior and an expert. Um, and so I applaud her. And I'm so happy I get to work with her. So thank you, Deandra. Thank you. 
All right. We're pivoting a little bit, but also to talk about something that's really important for us to understand in the community. And we've got the wonderful Brittany Taylor, who's uh, going to talk to us a little bit about cannabis use and the risks associated with that. Um, and she's got so much expertise, and I'm just excited for her to share her expertise with us today. So thank you, Brittany. And fun fact, Brittany is an amazing physician, but she also like taught my students and was like a mentor to them as they thought about how to care for underserved populations and thought about disparities. So just wears a dozen different hats and uh, super excited to have her and thank you for your time. I am just, I don't know how I can uh, follow that. Awesome. <laughs> I don't know either. I, I know. I was like, oh my goodness. I was like, that, that was amazing. You know, I, mean, like, I, as someone who, who I'm, I take care of a lot of patients with right. sickle cell um, and just, and just acknowledging the, the, the huge um, change. I apologize. My cat's going to be in the video a little bit. Um, the, the huge change that has happened, um, uh, you know, in the way that we provide care and the way that we view patients with that. I mean, I think uh, to acknowledge that she's uh, lived through that change as someone with sickle cell. I mean, it's just, it's night and day compared to when I first started medical school and now. Yeah, I'm thinking about my training and what we're experiencing now and what we're able to do now in the new yeah. treatments. And we'll have to do a whole nother session on treatments because that was a question too. But yeah. what you, what she did was amazing. So super yeah. appreciative. Oh, and I'll have, I'll hand it over to you. To, yeah. To okay. So I'll share my screen now. So that way I can actually um, focus myself, but it, again, it's difficult um, to follow <laughs> that appropriately. Um, so let me open this up. This is a long presentation. So I, I tried to shorten it. I'm not very good at it, at shortening things. So, so here we are. Um, so I'm basically going to try and hit some high points just about um, cannabis, um, or marijuana, whatever you want to call it. I'll probably call them one or the other. I usually call it cannabis. I don't know. I like to see where it's a little bit better. <laughs> so just some of the high points of um, some of the information that we know about it um, and just some like basically like 101 topics about um, cannabis. So basically when plants and people collide, um, so why does it matter? Um, it's very controversial. Um, people get very upset talking about it. A lot of people have a lot of different opinions around it. Um, the more and more states are being legalized. We know that Michigan is one of those states. Um, and we've had a very consistent um, surveys that show that teenage and young adults um, are starting to use and they're starting to abuse them more um, during uh, as, as these states become more legalized. Um, Colorado, I always use them as an example. So there's like a 51% higher use rate um, than the national average. And that was in 2011. Um, it wasn't legalized until 2014, which seems like not that long ago, but actually that long ago too, um, almost 10 years. Um, and their usage um, would just uh, skyrocketed following this. Another interesting thing that I like to point out is that as of January 2016, so maybe this has changed a little bit, um, but that there was more retail dispensaries, um, so cannabis retail dispensaries um, in the state of Colorado than there were Starbucks or McDonald's, which is just, you know, surprising given how much people really love um, their Diet Coke and um, coffee. Um, so what are the different kinds of cannabis? Um, so there's two main um, strains that you may have heard about. So sativa is the one that is more energizing. People will take it in the morning, um, kind of helps them focus. That's what people will say. Um, and that it has a little bit more THC to CBD. Um, and indica um, is the other, the other flip of that ratio. So it has more CBD than THC. It's more calming and relaxing and people will use it for either to help with pain or um, for nighttime to help to sleep as well. There's a lot of different formulations that it also can come in. So keef is a powder um, that comes from the CBD rich glands on the cannabis plants. They're called trichomes. Um, hashish is kind of a similar thing to this. It's either in a powder form um, or you can mix it with food. And then ha um, hash oil is an oil of that. Um, edibles, a lot of people know about this. And so it's usually when a food product um, is infused with man, uh, marijuana or cannabis, usually it's either directly added or it's made with a butter or oil or some sort of alcohol that has cannabis in it. Tinctures are something that you might put, it's in liquid form that you would put on um, to your skin, which is similar to topicals, which is, this, um, which is a salver cream that again has an oil that either was infused with cannabis or has um, some, um, something that you put in your mouth or spray. So lots of different ways to consume this. I feel like if you've ever been to a, a cannabis shop, um, 
there are just so many different ways uh, um, uh, as opposed to the typical smoking or vaping um, that has been more popularly discussed. Um, so when you're thinking about the way that it works, um, how it kind of um, affects the body is that when you smoke something or you vape it, you get um, the onset of that high really, really quickly. Um, so usually within 10 to 15 minutes, as opposed to when you ingest it, um, usually through an edible, um, it's going to take a lot longer. So as you can see, um, the peak plasma levels um, is going to be, so the time that's highest in your blood is almost an hour to two hours after. And a lot of times a pharmacological action, so aka getting high from it or having else effects can take two to three hours. Um, and I like to point this out because with oral, a lot of times we'll take it and then we'll expect that we're going to feel those symptoms of it. And it's going to take a long time for us to actually get to that. And then so people may have a tendency to overdose or take too much because they're not feeling the effects because it's really two or three hours down the line. I always also point that out for like driving, et cetera, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, and so a lot of people are like, well, aren't they naturally made in the body? And I say, sort of. Um, so endocannabinoids um, are the ones that you make in your brain. Um, you naturally make them. Phytocannabinoids, and the phyto meaning plant, um, are the ones that come from a plant. And then there's also synthetic cannabinoids as well. So ones that are made in a lab. Um, and our endocannabinoid system is a system that's throughout our brain and our body. Um, and they have two different kinds of receptors. There's CD1, which is cannabinoid, cannabinoid receptor one, and then cannabinoid receptor two. The main one that's in the brain is CB1. Uh, CB2 is throughout the rest of the body as well. THC um, works very well at CB1. CBD works at both of them, just not quite as well as CB1. So that's why we don't think of CBD as quite as acting on our brain, um, because it, there's not quite as many receptors in the brain um, that are CB2, which is really where CBD works well. Um, and CB, it only works a little bit on the brain. Um, and we have two different, and I'm not going to try and butcher those names, um, that are endocannabinoids that basically work and kind of mimic what THC or are what THC and CBD does to the brain. And so again, I just like to point out that it's all over the brain, it's all over the body, but CB1 is primarily in the brain. Um, and the and this again, kind of sciencey, but the whole point is that um, that these endo cannabinoids um, that work on the CB1 receptor um, work very, very quickly. Um, and they help to kind of develop the brain and um, kind of sense uh, where our memory, our appetite, how we um, perceive the world, our mood, pain, sleep, lots of different um, physical and mental manifestations of this. Um, and that we do this in a way that's very quick onset. Um, so when we feel some, some sort of discomfort, the endocannabinoids help us perceive that very, very quickly. In comparison to phyto, which is the plant kinds, those work as you, as I was just showing, work for hours. They're in there for a very, very long time in our, our bloodstream. So endogenous, aka the ones that we make ourselves, have very short duration, seconds um, of action, as opposed to exogenous or the ones that we consume. They have a much longer and non-physiologic, meaning it's not the way that bi our biology is intended to, to experience those cannabinoids. Um, and so it activates those, can those cannabinoid receptors much longer than they're really supposed to have been um, have been activated if it had been from a cannabinoid, a cannabinoid that we had made um, ourselves. Um, so monitoring and lab testing, I just want to point out um, that we mainly do urine testing. And I like to point out that chronic heavy users, and so that's someone who uses maybe once daily, can be, um, can be positive in their urine up to 67 days after last use. And I've had case, like patients who have been almost three months. Um, naive users, so someone who's maybe only used once or twice or only uses occasionally, even after using, um, might not um, be present. Um, and there is some things such as PPI, so omeprazole or Nexium can actually cause a false positive with this um, in the urine. Um, we don't really do blood testing, but we probably should because it's probably going to be much more um, specific for them. So a lot of people are like, oh, but can you just prescribe this now? Isn't this just something that doctors do now? And I'm like, well, not really. 
There's actually only four medications. Uh, these are F FDA regulated medications um, that we are able to be prescribed by physicians um, that are synthetic um, cannabinoids. Um, so dronabinol or marinol is the main and, the, mo and the, the one that has the most history. And we really use this for weight loss and chemotherapy associated nausea and vomiting. So those who are undergoing cancer treatment. Um, Nabilone, naxabinols and cannabidiol um, are all kind of a similar, but not quite as um, commonly used. Um, Epidiolex or cannabinol, ca cannabidiol, killing these names today, um, is really used in children um, who have a very severe seizure disorder. Um, Sativex um, is used in multiple sclerosis. We actually don't have that in the U.S. It's only used in Europe right now. And sesame is also used for nausea and vomiting associated with chemotherapy, so cancer treatment. Um, most of the side effects associated with them are kind of the side effects that you would think if you were getting high from it. So you get dizzy, you get tired, you might be a little paranoid, sometimes your stomach hurts. It can actually cause nausea and vomiting, can make you more anxious. So all the kind of side effects of being high from that. So those are the only four medications that actually are um, cannabis products, basically, that we're able to prescribe as a physician. So that's different than medical marijuana, which is not a pharmaceutical. So the FDA does not regulate um, medical marijuana. So even if you got a card to go get it, um, there is a lot of variability in the potency and actually how much um, THC or CBD is in each one. It is not regulated by the FDA. And I really want to stress that, that the medications that we provide are very strict. They have to be exactly this amount of THC, exactly this much CBD every single time. And that's actually why they're synthetic, because there's so many different formulations in a plant um, that really changes the way that the THC or CBD is expressed, et cetera. Um, there's just, it's just no way to perfectly um, make that much THC and CBD. You get a rough estimate of that. I always try and compare it to like, if everyone's ever had like a rosemary bush or had, or gone to like the store and they've gotten a box of strawberries. Sometimes you're like, this is a good batch of strawberries. It was awesome. Uh, it was so sweet, et cetera, et cetera. And the next time you go and get the same batch, it could be from the same, um, the same farm. And you're like, this wasn't quite as good of a batch. And so the same thing happens when it's medical marijuana, because again, it's made from the plants. Um, and there's, it can be susceptible again to pesticides, mold, fungus, bacteria. And again, there's no federal guidelines for testing the medical marijuana for either the potency, so how much THC is actually in it, or the contaminants. You don't know if you're getting a good batch of strawberries or an okay batch of strawberries. Um, again, just want to point that out, that medical marijuana is not um, as well regulated as some of the medications, the four that I was just describing. And then, but then you're like, well, even if it isn't quite as much THC, does it really matter? Um, and I'm like, well, there is a lot of negative effects um, to smoking or even consuming marijuana. Um, and a lot of the stuff as use continues to increase and continues to go, uh, continues to happen, we're going to be able to see more and more what the chronic effects are. But in the short term, it can definitely impair your short term memory, your ability to learn and maintain information, as well as your motor coordination and your perception. I mean, that's some of the reason that you use it because it changes the way that you perceive the world and your anxiety and different things like that. So they found that in the states that have legalized marijuana, um, that there have been increased motor vehicle crashes. Michigan is one of those states. Um, so consuming cannabis before driving increases the rate of motor vehicle accidents. And particularly young adults often believe that driving after marijuana is a lot safer than alcohol. That is just not the case. Um, and so um, one of the big things I also like to point out is that some of the effects in short-term memory and ability to learn as well as maintain information can be up to 24 hours after consuming um, the cannabis. So say you might have used something for the night before, the next morning you might, or a, a student or someone else might not be able to function quite as well, even if they're not realizing it or be able to learn quite as well, even if they had used the night before. Um, there's also a lot of um, data about paranoia and psychosis, so meaning like to the point where you would need to be hospitalized um, in certain individuals. In the long term with heavy use, there is evidence supporting 
And this is kind of how I like to sort these things. And they're hopefully coming out with new guidelines about this because this is from 2017. This is a very extensive review about all the different um, uh, levels of evidence for, um, for if this was actually helpful, if this was hurtful, et cetera, the cannabis that, of all the studies that were done. It's a really good review document for it. Um, so some of the things that has been sub, been shown to cause in the long term is something called hyperemesis cannabis syndrome. And I'll talk about this later. Um, it might trigger heart attacks. It might trigger strokes. It actually decreases um, metabolic syndrome, so weight gain. But it was in, shown to be with increased rate of development of prediabetes as well as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or bronchitis, um, COPD. Um, it's been shown to be anti-inflammatory, which can be good and bad. Um, so sometimes that can actually decrease your immune system because that's what inflammation um, is, is there for. Um, it's often been associated with chronic cough, um, getting recurrent um, infections with bronchitis and a lot of phlegm. And they found that just quitting helped relieve a lot of these symptoms within one to two months. Um, it hasn't really been associated with any sort of head and neck or lung cancer, um, but it has been associated with a very uncommon kind of testicular cancer. It was a very slight association. There has been no good data one way or the other about prostate, cervical, penile, esophageal cancer, or lymphoma, kind of blood cancer. Um, the risk of MI, again, if uh, or a heart attack. So again, it's triggering a heart attack, but not necessarily causing heart attack, if that makes sense. Um, hasn't shown that people are more likely to develop asthma or make their asthma worse, that even if the COPD um, or the chronic bronchitis is happening, that it actually leads to more hospital, uh, hospital admissions, that it doesn't, there's been no specific things on the immune system itself, worsening of cirrhosis or hepatitis C, or any occupational injuries and accidents. And so I want to highlight that when it's, we're talking about no evidence, just that so there's not good evidence about this, um, and that it just hasn't been well studied. This doesn't necessarily mean that cannabis doesn't lead or isn't associated or make things worse or better in any of these fields, but there just isn't a lot of data to say one way or the other. Cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome is something that we see more and more commonly, particularly I see it a lot when I'm in Hurley, when I'm working at Hurley, and there's these discrete episodes that happen in there have just not so much nausea and vomiting, um, and it happens usually for three to four days. It's often associated with heavy or daily use, but sometimes those who, individuals who are only smoking once or twice or eat, having edibles once or twice a week will have this. One of the hallmark things that I, um, I see is that people are have the symptoms are relieved with hot showers or bathing. The only proven treatment um, to help stop this from happening is stopping smoking or consuming cannabis. So see this a lot. And honestly, all we can do on when they're in the hospitals, we give them a lot of different anti-nausea medications and we give them a lot of IV fluids. And we see this a lot. And again, the only way to stop this kind of thing from happening is to stop using marijuana. <clears throat> In adolescents, particularly, I'm concerned when they're using very heavily because it can. It's more been associated with a use disorder. So again, you can be addicted to, to smoking cannabis. Um, that they are, might be more impulsive, more likely to commit suicide, kind of linked to that, and that they um, and that those who smoke cannabis more heavily have been um, shown to have decreased motivation. They're less likely to graduate high school, less less likely to be employed later on, and they have lower income. Um, lower in, later in life as well. And they often have poor relationships with their friends, families, etc. Um, they it can affect the way that the brain is developing. Again, uh, that hippocampus and the cerebellum do a lot with balance and the hippocampus does a lot with your emotions. So if they really start smoking earlier on, their brain is still developing. And so it actually makes the brain smaller in those areas and probably doesn't function quite as well. So when it comes to mental health, there's a lot of evidence that this can worsen schizophrenia and other psychoses. So really, really significant mental health disorders. The more that you use, the higher the risk that this might develop. It makes hypomania. And so a lot of those like symptoms with bipolar worse. Again, more suicidal ideations to attempts and completion for those who have been using marijuana. Um, you can actually develop social anxiety because you might need it. Um, and then again, increased risk for other substance abuse. Um, and there's limited evidence that it might worsen depression and anxiety um, and increase anxiety and PTSD symptoms. Um, but it hasn't been found to uh, kind of affect um, depression or develop PTSD. 
So pregnancy and breastfeeding, I just always want to talk about this briefly, is that marijuana and cannabis crosses the placenta. Um, so when you are developing a baby, the baby is being able to see all the marijuana that you are, that you are consuming. Um, and again, the endocannabinoids, those cannabinoids our body makes, they are critical in neurodevelopment. Uh, and smoking during pregnancy has been associated with lower birth weight infants. Um, that has been shown to have increased pregnancy complications um, and that the, the baby is often has to stay in the hospital longer. It hasn't been associated with any chromosomal or congenital malformations um, or and a couple other uh, different things in terms of that are kind of more medicine-y related, um, but again, has been associated with um, more preterm labor, premature labor, smaller babies, um, and, and so we always try and we caution mothers who are breastfeeding or, pre or pregnant or hoping to become pregnant with their use of cannabis during that time because we know that it crosses the placenta and we know that the baby is seeing this. Um, and again, um, the same thing it is in breast milk as well. So if someone is breastfeeding, the baby is also seeing that as well. And then can it just help my symptoms? A lot of the patients that I see are taking this because they are trying to make themselves feel better, whether it's through pain, anxiety, depression, et cetera. So they're doing this as well. Um, so I'm going to run through this. I know I've been talking for too long as always. Um, um, no, no, not at all. This is perfect information. Thank you. But um, I'm just going to focus over here on where there is evidence for good, good outcomes um, is that it has been cannabis as a therapy has been shown to be effective for chronic pain. Um, it is effective when used in the correct way. Um, it can help again with chemotherapy. So cancer treatment associated nausea and vomiting and it's been shown to be helpful for short-term sleep outcomes. So ironically, when I was reading this, um, the studies that they've done is that people have the perception that it helps them sleep more. But when they actually studied it, people didn't sleep any better than they did previously. They didn't fall asleep quicker. They didn't fall asleep for longer. They didn't have deeper sleep whatsoever. Um, but the people had the perception that they were, that they were sleeping better. So again, perception is a lot of things. So I get that. Um, and I don't really talk too much about that, but in terms of things that don't have any evidence that cannabis is helpful for. So some seizure disorders, irritable bowel syndrome, anxiety disorders, dementia, such as Parkinson's, schizophrenia, um, and different as a cancer therapy themselves. And then in the addiction of other substances. Um, so cannabis has not been proven to be helpful in all those, a lot of different things. Um, even though it might be touted as some sort of therapy for these things, it hasn't been shown to be exceptionally helpful in treating any of them. So I will, I will save this for another time and I will skip to my questions. Um, my, my, <laughs> Here's my all the slide of um of cannabis blowing in the wheat and the breeze. This is hilarious. Yeah. It's, it's like actually it's a video, so the whole thing yeah. is moving and yeah. We'll um, loop and you can just <laughs> breathe. This was super out. amazing. I you you talk about this and in the office, you know, the 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 issue of cannabis use is is something that is often hard to to talk about with patients, right? Because there's so much mixed data out there. And we have often discussed the idea of, is there some benefit or harm reduction? Yes, thank you for stopping that. Because I was like, wait, where am I looking? <laughs> I know. Is there any harm reduction? If we think about like, okay, can you pivot from your daily smoking to a different sort of use, right? Because you talked about the risks associated with smoke and, and it looked like even with your data that there was more risk associated with sort of um, the smoking effects. Has there been any data that shows like that you can get some harm reduction if you switch people's methodology, right? Like, would it be equivalent to saying, okay, you do vodka shots, maybe that's 35% alcohol. Can we at least decrease how much alcohol you're taking in? So a lot of, you know, the, with marijuana addiction, which is a thing, you can be addicted to marijuana. Dependence is a huge thing. And I took like a lot of that out because it's a huge part of it. Yeah. Um, go on and on about it. But a lot of the data in the literature right now about um, cannabis um, dependence is about decre just decreasing the amount yeah. um, because it's so difficult for people to stop. 
Yeah. Um, and a lot of times what I try and talk to them about is because the percentage um, is very high and it's a lot higher than it used to be yeah. uh, in cannabis. Um, um, like that, that previously, like in the sixties and seventies, it used to be like 4% was a THC. Now yeah. people THC is like 12, 20% is like when you go in and purchase um, it to know how much THC is in it and maybe decrease the amount of THC that you're actually consuming. Right when you're doing it or just decreasing the amount that you're smoking, um, either switching over to using tinctures or right. edibles, different things like that, because smoking it is very harmful itself exactly. to the lungs. Um, yeah. and so switching over to edibles might help with some of that as well. So just kind of educate, um, the, the individuals to like be empowered to know what you're consuming yourself. Um, cause we would, we, we expect that for our medications. We expect that for our supplements. We expect that from when we go to the, to the supermarket, et cetera, that we know what we're consuming and to be empowered and to know actually what we're, what we're taking in. And that might help us cut down on that amount, if that makes sense. No, so. that's, that's actually the, the question I was asking. And I wanted to get to the answer to Dr. G's question, which is what are effective treatments for marijuana addiction? And your answer that like it's really really hard and it's probably a, its own presentation but let's think about dosing and how we you know harm reduction and decrease our sources yeah. we are at time and I don't want to keep you longer than I'm supposed to I want to be respectful of everyone special shout out to Deandra Smith again thank you for all of your resources and the Red Cross we will see you next week we'll show you the slide for those continuing education credits and thank you